So today I'm going to be talking about art, science, and conservation, and how they can merge together and actually do um, greater, be greater forces for conservation. So when you add art and science together with conservation, it's, conservation actually has much greater outcomes. And so I, I'm a National Geographic photographer, and it's, it's like one of those things when you're in the club, then you're always in the club. Um, <laughs> But then I've decided to go back to school, and so I'm currently at Drexel University getting my PhD in biology. And so conservation biology was the goal to go back to school. And so just that line, I'm going to first talk about the lab I'm in. And so we have two groups we work with, the Central African Biodiversity Alliance and the Bioko Biodiversity Protection Program. And then talk more about this merging of art, science, and conservation and then talk about an example of it in intimacy with the Republic of Congo in the lowland gorillas and chimpanzees. And then just talk a little bit about the kind of research I'm doing now for the future. And so this is our lab at Drexel University. Um, we're actually lucky because we have Deme from um, Equatorial Guinea and Ikoge from Cameroon. So we have a very diverse international um, group of people in the lab. And Hilton's actually from Brazil. And so we do a lot of conservation biology work, but then our PI, Katie Gonder, her main emphasis in, is genetics. So she was the one who realized that the chimpanzees in Cameroon were actually a subspecies of chimpanzees. So they're the Eliadi chimpanzees, whereas like the Gombe chimpanzees are swine fernii, and the chimpanzee most people know from Africa and jungles is Trogolides. And so Jill Pretz, um, the Senegalese ch um, chimpanzees are, oh, I always forget their name. But the, there are another subspecies. So there's four subspecies. And so we have a study abroad. So we bring undergrads to Bioko Island. Um, and so they get to work with the Unhe students from the local university and then the Drexel University. And so they take field courses. And they learn about the history of the island. They also get to spend three months in Africa on an island. And because, so I found that pretty quickly, most parents don't want to send their kids to Africa. <laughs> and so this is one of the few programs that'll actually, you can do that. But the biggest problem we have is parents not wanting to send their kids to Africa. And so the, what we work with is the Bioko Biodiversity Protection Program. And so then on the island, so we're working on Bioko. And so here's Cameroon, you have Equatorial Guinea, Gabon. And the island is actually small. I mean, you can drive around it in one day. But it has these two large reserves that take up about half the space. And so this reserve is pretty hunted. Like, it's surrounded by villages. But this one didn't have access until recently. And now a road goes to the middle. But previously, no one really went in here, except for us to do research. And so the reason the island is so important is because it has the highest primate diversity in Africa. And it's more about, it doesn't have the great apes, but it has numerous of the monkeys and then the galagos, lots of different small apes. And you have drills also, which is a type of baboon. They have very beautiful colorations. And so, then with the, the work we do on the island, a lot of it is with the education and outreach. And that's what a lot of that um, material outside is for. And so we created a, a book series, and we use that to go to the schools and then teach people about turtles and then now monkeys also. And it's actually been really, really effective. Like, um, the young children we've reached have all decided they don't want to eat bushmeat anymore. They want to conserve the environment. And we'll see how that if it stays with them as they grow up. But previously, they didn't have any of these beliefs. And so with that, we long term, so this reserve actually has a village right in the middle here, Eureka. And so the people of Eureka have always been helping with the program. And so they do turtle surveys, they do primate surveys. Um, but that was pretty much restricted to the younger people in the village. And so recently, we started the, the Artisan Collective. And now a lot of the older generation have been able to 
create arts and crafts and actually get income with it. Because now that the road has been built, um, more people are going to the southern beaches, and that's where the sea turtles nest. And so there's actually tourism, and so now they have a different livelihood besides just the research, which is working great. And so then the Central African Biodiversity Alliance that we also work with, we take um, groups of students from the US, Cameroon, Equatorial Guinea, Gabon, all over West Africa. And then we have field courses in national parks. And so this is a field course and I taught the large mammal team. And we had a bird team, a butterfly team, a chimpanzee team. And it's great because you actually get students mingling. And a lot of the problems is you'll have an international workshop or something and everyone segregates into their own little spot. But despite the language barrier, this, because everyone's young and they're in college, like, they end up really forming strong bonds and getting to know each other. And so this is Cameroon where we were working. So we were in, in Bamjerum Park here. And so this is all kind of connected. So Cameroon's here, here's Bioko. And that'll come into play later. But this whole area is the greater Gulf of Guinea. And so this is one of the biodiversity hotspots in the world. And it's because you have this savanna area with Nigeria and Chad meeting the jungle area. And so it's an ecotone is what they call it. And so, like I'm used to working in the forests of Africa and you have forest elephants. Here you have savanna elephants coming in and then forest elephants coming in. So it's an area where you have species from different habitats actually coming together and meeting. And so for researching evolution, it's a great place to work. And so this is just a clip from a buy um, with camera traps from Cameroon. And so the large mammal team, this is the study they did. We set up camera traps at this buy, and then they analyzed it to see what animals arrive when and how many are in the group sizes. <laughs> I thought it was crazy because of not the warthogs mess with all the other ones. And so this is, we were actually coming in, oh that pauses it. We were coming into the bay at this point, and that's why all these baboons started standing up. And that's what I actually love about camera traps is the behaviors you can get from them. Okay, so I'm going to try and explain what I mean by merging art, science, and conservation. And I'm still working on this one. It, it makes sense to me, but I have to make sure it makes sense to everybody else, too. <laughs> and so the idea is you have what's called a green triangle. And so you have art, science, and conservation. And they actually intersect in ways each way. So with conservation, you actually have to have the science to understand how you're going to effectively conserve areas. But without art, no one's, without media, without attention, no one's really going to know what the conservation is. No one's going to care. And the same is for science. Like, sadly, you can publish a lot, but in general, people aren't going to read it, the majority of people. But if you publish in National Geographic or Smithsonian, then you actually reach a wider audience. And for the art side, the whole reason I came back to school is because I wanted to be a better photographer. And if I actually understand the science I'm photographing and the ecology behind everything, then that actually helps me produce better photos that could say, explain all that in just an image, which is the hardest thing to do. But the other side of it all is conservation is not, there's kind of two thoughts for conservation biology is the, the rational pragmatic that nature conservancy is kind of moved towards. And then the old school way of that it's, there's just this intrinsic value. And so with art is really the only way you can show there's a, just an intrinsic value with nature. And so otherwise you're gonna have to prove, well, you know, you need clean water to be healthy or if you have this park, you can have jobs from ecotourism. But the intrinsic side, you can only really show with art. And so an example of these three working together is the, the mega transect that happened in about the 2000s. So it was a big three-part story with National Geographic. Um, my father actually photographed it. 
And David Quammen, a real famous writer, wrote the articles. And this scientist, Mike Fay, decided that he was going to walk across Republic of Congo, Gabon, and then hit the coast. And he wanted to do basically a mega train sink, a one long walk recording everything he saw and all the human signs, all the animal signs. And so he, it's, it was a crazy idea. He had a large team of um, first Bioca pygmies, and then when he went to Gabon, he had to switch a whole new team because you're crossing the border. Um, but it actually, in the end, what happened with that, because they had the scientists doing the walk, this, the conservation from WCS that had been working there forever, and then the photography in the magazine articles, and it really moved the president. And once he saw what was in his country, they decided to create 13 national parks, which was 10% of the country. And before, they had no national parks, no park system. And so it, it happened quickly, but it was work over many years with NGOs like actually doing on-the-ground conservation work. But it really was about the president seeing these photos and being moved about what he had in his country. Because it was this thing that he, he didn't know what was in his country. Like, um, yeah, he's, the president stays in Louisville. He doesn't go all over here. He doesn't know there's hippos along the coast that go in the ocean. Like, there's all these beautiful parts of Gabon he just didn't know about. And so now I'll get into the kind of the story that I was involved with intimately that I can describe how this all kind of comes together. And so this is the Republic of Congo. And so you have two sites, Mandika and Gulogo. And this is actually uh, the chimps all had names at Gulogo, and this one was actually Jane, named after Jane Goodall. But she was a favorite of the, um, the high-ranking alpha male. And so you have Republic of Congo. And again, here's Kyoko, Cameroon, Gabon. And so just Mike Fay, his walk was kind of around here, and then he went all the way there. Um, but for the chip and gorilla work I did, it was in, in Doki National Park. And so the chip work was down in this spot right outside of the park. And the gorilla work was all up here outside of the park, too, near the border. And getting there was uh, quite a trip. <laughs> so it's, to get there, of course, you fly in and it takes from the US to Charles de Gaulle, you get to Gabon, or Congo. But in the past, during the war, we had to go to Gabon and then fly over in Cessnas to Congo, just because you couldn't fly into Congo. But so then, once you got into Congo, then you would have to take a domestic flight up north. So you get in Brazzaville, which should be down here. And then you take a flight to Weso, which is around here. And then you take a boat, six hour boat ride up the Sangha to get to Ndoka Park. And that's if you're lucky and you got the speedboat or something. If you're in the long dugouts with the small motor, it could be like 12 hours. And that's after you flew, you know, two hours, two days to get there. You get in the Brazzaville, you fly it away, so. And you're not used to, you've been here, and you're not on the equator, so as soon as you get out in the sun, you just fry. Um, and so you get to Bomasa, which is the field camp there. And then from there, you have to take a two-hour truck drive. And then you get to another small river. And that's when you take pirogues, which are just cut out trees. And you, you know, you've got the lip is that far away from the water, so you're just kind of not trying to rock the boat. But you're loaded up with all your gear. Because then you have to do a 26-kilometer walk to get to the actual camp. And so that's why this place was so unique, because besides all of that, you have, it's all surrounded by swamps. So no one ever went in there to hunt, just because it was just too difficult. And so then once you get to camp, it's great. You have a 
forested camp, uh, electricity from the solar panels. Uh, we had a river to bathe in, which was that dark from all the tannin. Um, so I liked it, but if you're afraid to get into black, brackish water, it's not very <laughs> ideal. <laughs> um, but so these are, Dave Morgan was the head researcher in Cricket Songs, and she's now at um, St. Louis in Washington. Uh, St. Louis. Washington University in St. Louis. Um, and he's actually does a lot of work at Lincoln Park Zoo. But he now runs this site and Mondika. And so they've been, he was a zookeeper, oh, I can't remember where, in the south, and just loved grills and chimps. And all he wanted to do was get to a site where he could study grills and chimps. And so he eventually found someone in this area and begged them to let him go and just volunteered. And he's in his late 20s and he's been there ever since, since like 95 or so. And so you, you, know, you live in a camp and so you have a tent. Um, and so I actually, nine months in a tent is pretty nice. I mean, you don't, you don't really have much worries to deal with because you just have a couple things, and you, you wake up every day, you go out at four in the morning, you come back at night, and then you just do the same thing over again. And you don't have to worry about paying taxes or getting your food together, like all, everything's cooked for you. But it's full of insects, and it's, I got, yeah, it's funny, whenever I see this tent, I remember I got malaria five times, so I was in this tent a lot. Um, and that was just because of, it's hard, like, chimp research is probably the hardest research you can do. Because they're, they're fast and they're as smart as you and they don't want to be seen. And so you spend a lot of time walking and looking for chimps. And when you're out all day, it's long days and you can't, you don't want to necessarily be eating too much in the forest because then you're leaving food that then they can come get to because you can pass on every disease you have, you can give to the chimps. So we wouldn't defecate in the forest if we did. If we had to, we'd just put it in the bag and carry it back with us. Um, which, as soon as someone does once, they don't want to do again. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a beautiful forest. Like, you have these giant trees. And we couldn't have done it without the Bayaka pygmies and then the Congolese assistants. Like, they have a, actually a pretty good university program. And I think even more so, they have very dedicated students. And so Sidney now, I think he got his PhD in Michigan. And he's now doing um, research on fungi in um, Congo. But a lot, the great thing is a lot of these, the great assistants in these sites end up getting to go to school in America or England because of the connections with the researchers. And then the, and so the, most of the trackers were Bayaka pygmies. And so they're genetically shorter because they, they've been in the forest longer than any other human. And they know the forest better than anybody. Um, the truth is most um, people that live in Africa don't want to live in the forest because it's a dangerous place and people die there, you get malaria. Um, but the pygmies, that is their, where they prefer to live. And, as more development comes, they're hit, being hit more with that. And then, of course, the young people want to have radios and everything. But if you're walking through the forest, they can explain everything. And you can, they can see, oh, there is a, a gorilla walked by here an hour ago, just because of how everything has changed. And it seems like maybe they're making things up or something like that. But as soon as you spend enough time, you see it's all real. And it took me like seven or six months. But then after that, I started to see, like, you, you can look at the forest and know that, well, that leaf shouldn't be like that. And then you start to kind of click how things work. And you start to realize so you use the trees to navigate where you are. And so instead of thinking, oh, I'm on this trail, I started realizing, well, this tree, that tree, like, you start to pick out the landmarks, like buildings. And so everything is carried in. And so that means you, we ate mostly sardines, 
uh, smoked fish. Cans want like pink meat, cubed meat. It's not, it's not, it's worse than spam. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, you have a meal in the morning and a meal at night. And it was more, like I probably was getting sick so much because you can't, it's hard to keep up your calories with how much work you're actually doing. And then also body shape. Like I, being a tall person walking through the forest, you're constantly ducking and trying to avoid things. Whereas a lot of the pygmies just, it's no problem because they're much shorter. <laughs> And thankfully, we did get some greens. And so uh, the two cooks would sometimes go out into the forest and collect a leaf. It was a vine that actually, all the gorillas and chimps also love to eat it because, and I don't know if this is true, because I think they told me this to make me feel better. <laughs> but they said it for a, a plant, it actually has a decent amount of protein in it, um, which would make sense of why the gorillas and chimps go after it so much. But I thought they were saying that just to make me feel better about being so skinny and <laughs> getting sick all the time. And so this first site I'll talk about of these two is Mandika. And so that's a site where they actually had habituated gorillas. And the thing is, so with the chimps, they weren't habituated. And habituation is when you've got an animal so used to humans that you can basically follow it every day. And so they had gotten these gorillas where you could be, the researchers were within five meters at all times, which they quickly changed when other people took over because, as everyone at the zoo here knows, primates will get all the diseases that humans have. And so they have a, they call it a seven meter rule, but it's usually 10 meter. And that's basically the, as close as you can get to the primates because if you're any closer, if you have the flu or anything, you can pass it on to the primates. And this site actually had a bad problem because the cook had tuberculosis. And they had a gorilla die from tuberculosis just because they were just in too close contact with them. And I can say, the silverback having researchers around him within five meters all the time, like you could tell he was just stressed about it. And then the females stayed much farther away. And so when new people took over, well, when they took over, and they actually instituted these better rules, you could tell the stress level dropped because the females were closer, and he just wasn't as, he didn't have to deal with that stress anymore. And so this area is pretty swampy. Um, and there's something, I don't know if most people realize that, so you have the flooded forest in the Amazon, but then in, Africa, you actually have a lot of flooded forests too. And so this is a swampy area, and they would visit it at least once a week because all these herbs they would eat are very rich in nutrients. Um, but it was a, a situation where you have that original photo in the beginning. Uh, let's see. So that's the silverback Kingo. And so he would just go right in the middle of the swamp and sit down and just start eating. But all the females had to stay on that periphery just because they were smaller and they weren't as strong. And they had the children to look after. And so this is what happened a lot when I was there in the beginning when there was a five-day rule. And so there's the chest beating that gorillas do. And it's a call that you can hear throughout the forest. And he would end up doing it like twice a day only because the females would be ranging really far. And that's just because we were always on him five meters. And so there were certain females that, like one female that attacked a lot of people. She just didn't like people, so she stayed away. And so then he would spend an hour waiting for the females to come and get more and more frustrated and then end up chest beating a lot to try and get them to call him. But his, so, Speaking of the stress of it, so as a silverback, he has to keep in his mind all the fruiting trees. And so he's got a root every day that he takes. And he's trying to hit, OK, this tree might be fruiting. Or he might need to check it to see if it's fruiting. In addition to keeping an eye on all the females. Because if you, so they're habituated, but they're still animals. So if you got in between, 
the line of him and the females, he would charge me. And I don't think he ever hit anyone. He might have bit someone in the very beginning. But he, like, I, I was there with him when he did it. He would go and just swipe and be, you know, inches away from you. He knew exactly how close he could get. Or he would, if you were near any sapling, he would grab it and shake it around you. And so, even though they, everyone knew he was habituated, it was still hard to keep everyone from running away if he ended up charging. <laughs> um, and that became even more so when we had certain researchers that didn't, just saw him as a study subject. And they didn't realize, well, even though these girls are habituated, you still, if you get in between him and the females, he's going to charge you. And that happened a lot. And it, was, it, was a, it was difficult. <laughs> But one of the things I didn't expect with the gorillas is the amount that the father of the silverback actually puts in. Because um, I thought, oh, the, the females, they take care of the children, and they, they're the, the sole parent, really. But what you see is that the females, at a certain point, when the child's about two or one and a half, they start ranging far again and then leaving the kids with the silverback during the day. And so it's that hot part of the day, usually. Or if it's just it's food that the females want to go find, they'll just leave the children with Kingo. And so that's when, because he seems like this distant individual, and he wouldn't interact with them. But then you start to see when he's alone with the children, he'll end up playing with them. There's a lot more interactions than he has with them. And even. Even with the older juveniles, like it's not till a, a blackback gorilla male is pretty old that he'll actually leave the group. And you do end up with groups where you have, you can have all orphans, or you can have a couple of males together that are hanging out, or two silverbacks hanging out. Like it's not as cut and dry as you're going to have a silverback and he can't tolerate any other silverbacks. And his whole mode of operation, it wasn't like, oh, you they run into another gorilla group and they're going to fight or chest beat at each other. They would hear the other gorillas and then just sneak off because it's much easier for him to not fight than to actually have a fight. And so when I was there, I was lucky enough that um, Beatrice had had a newborn child. And even within the females, there was a wide range of parenting. And so she was completely devoted to her child, constantly looking at it, playing with it. Whereas in Belly, she um, would half the time leave her, in Kinde, her child in the tree. Like, she'd forget he's up there and come down. Like, and she was a very young mother, but still, like, her attention to her child was very different than Beatrice's. And then, of course, everyone who worked there loved her because she, she didn't bite anyone. <laughs> she had really pretty red hair. Um, yeah, she was a great girl. <laughs> and so the other thing I really didn't realize about gorillas is how many um, insects they eat for protein. And so you've got. You know, these are large animals, and they eat a ton of vegetation. Um, and so they supplement it with termites or uh, ants. And so in the swampy areas, they'd be eating ants, like, constantly, and pretty big red ants. And I always wanted to get a photo, but it, because it was so dark and in thickets, it was really hard to do. But then with the termites, so the chimps would have to use tools to get into the termite nest. But the gorillas are strong enough, they just break break it apart, and then eat it that way. And so they're actually not as efficient, but it's much easier for them. Oh, yeah, and speaking of tool use, they have seen uh, Dr. Thomas Brewer. He recorded um, gorillas in Mbele Bay. So it's a, very, it's a swampy area. It's a clearing. And the, they would some, the females would sometimes use sticks to test the waters before going through the swamp. 
And so now with the chimps of the glow of the triangle. And so I, this was actually the start of my work. And I got a grant to study tool use at this site. And so what was unique, what is unique here is that you have a toolkit. So they not only have a, a dipping brush, but they get a hard tool to break into the mound. And then this brush that they have, instead of just having a stick, they'll run it through their mouth to create a brush. And then they have surface area with that. And then with more surface area, that's more area for the termites to bite. And so they get more termites with every dip. And this is a behavior, they call it chimpanzee culture, that this community has. And there's a community right next door that doesn't do the same behaviors. And so with chimps, it's a, a fission-fusion culture community. And so like this community was about 40 individuals, but they would rarely all be in the same spot. They'd be very spread out, usually one or two together. But then when there's a fruiting fig tree or there's a lot of food, then they would actually all come together. And so this was at a, a fruiting fig. And so then they start interacting with each other and grooming and getting to know each other again. And that's when you have the alpha male will come in, or you have females with estrus, things like that. But the, so the males have this, would protect the entire territory as a whole. So usually once a month, you would actually hear at night the males hooting and kind of doing what you would call border patrol. And so, and so sometimes you would hear them yelling at chimps from another community across the river, which is pretty interesting. Um, it was usually like on a full moon when they could see at night much better. And so within that, that kind of territorial nature, so in Kabali in Uganda, they have a flush of fruiting figs. And so the chimpanzee communities have gotten larger and larger and larger. And now they have communities with so many males that they're actually conducting warfare on other communities because they have enough males that they can just send out a patrol and then attack another community and hurt a male and get females then to come to their community because they're showing that they're stronger. And that's not a behavior you see in other sites. You might see like single raids, but not that focused group of males just deciding they're going to go out. And so within each chimpanzee site, you actually have a lot of different types of culture. And so here, this is leaf sponging, which is pretty common with chimpanzee site. And they'll take a wad of leaves and chew it up and then use it to dip into a, a hole in a tree that has water in it, and then to get water. And so this is Lewis and his brother, Leaf. And so after he was finished doing this, I think he actually handed it to Leaf, and then Leaf tried it out. And so all of these tool techniques, they're, the children learn from being with the parents or the siblings. And so this is the mass of tools collected um, from going to all the termite mounds. And then these are for pounding for honey. And so they have a wide variation of tools. And so this is actually where Cole, a male, had attacked the nearby community and stolen a baby and killed it and used it like as a necklace. He had it wrapped around his neck and was showing it off to everyone else. And that's, cannibalism isn't that common in chimps. So it was, it was the first that we'd seen it at this site. But then this, the psychology behind it, so later on there was um, one of the older female chimps, Caroline, got wounded by a leopard. And then the leopard just waited till she died. And so that's kind of how the leopards um, hunt, is they'll just wound an animal and then just follow it until it dies. And so she passed, and she had a baby, her baby with her. And so Cole actually was the chimp that was in that area with her. And so we weren't sure if he was a son of her. Like, we don't know the, if they're related or not. But he stayed with the child the whole time. Like, he didn't try to eat it like he did the other one. He, he gently tried to remove it, and then when it didn't want to go, he, he just stayed in, nearby and watched it until it got dark, and then he left. But it was interesting to see that 
change. Like he, he didn't see this situation as the same as the other situation because this is his um, tribe. But sadly, of course, then the, the leopard came back and got the baby and um, ate the rest of Caroline. Um, but that's really the main predator they have is leopards. Um, and so when we follow them on the ground like a predator, that's you can tell they're, they're very unsure of what to think about that because the only other thing that does that is the leopard. And so this is getting into the honey pounding. And so she's covered in stingless bees. And so they'll build nests under the bark and they have honey. And so the chimps will spend more calories than they get from the honey to get the honey, <laughs> basically. And it's, the females are much better at it. In general, for all the tool use stuff, the females are much better. Um, but the males, it's more like, oh, if they see it, they'll, if they see someone else hunting, then they'll get excited and go for it. But a lot of the females would actively like spend their time trying to get honey. And so that's the kind of the easy way to do it. This is Dorothy. And she, I think she spent 38 minutes trying to get getting honey out of here. And so she started with one giant stick to break into the nest initially. And then switched to a smaller stick and then an even smaller one. But she actually kept she didn't just chuck the tools when she was done with them. She kept them up in the canopy with her in case she needed to go back and use another one again. Because she would go back and forth, like use a small one, then go back to the large one, until she finally got to where she could dip in there and get out the honey. And she was, of all the chimps, she was the one that the most would just go for this constantly. And she would even do this when she had a child. So she would be hanging precariously like this with a baby also hanging off her. But so you can see, shooting up, you get a lot of white. Like, it's not ideal. And so we wanted to figure out, well, how can we shoot from the canopy? And so the one way was to put up a platform in the canopy. And so it was a little, I think four by four. It's pretty small. I could barely fit on it. And so we put it about 40 feet up in the canopy. And that way, I could get a clear shot of the chimps. But I was up there for maybe two months, and I never saw anything. <laughs> yeah. And so we had set it up at fruiting trees, but the thing about fruiting trees in Africa is they never fruit when you think they're going to fruit. <laughs> and then especially the figs, they never, like, I've never known anyone who set up a platform at a fig and then it actually fruited. <laughs> like, it always then just doesn't fruit. But the last week, I had uh, Dorothy come by, for, and this with her child now, just for eight seconds walking by. And so I had enough time to get a frame, because you want to show that it is, they don't walk on the ground as much, because they have this highway up in the canopy. And they can see, like once I was up there, sitting up there, you realize you can see everything. Like You understand why they see you before you see them, because they're way up there. But it was, uh, I read a lot. I had to, so I climbed the rope to get up there. So because of all the bees, I would climb up and change all my, well, strip down, wipe any sweat off with um, towelettes, and then put all new clothes that have no scent or sweat around them at all. Because I was stationary. And I had a, two mosquito nets, but if the bees ever found me, I, was, I would lose, because they would just keep coming and coming and coming and coming. Um, and they would never stop coming, because they would know that I was a source for salt. And so there's the stingless bees. They're real small, and they can get it in your eyes and your ears. And so they just cover you when you get them. But the, there are bees that actually sting you. And so those are the ones like you, could, you would just get hammered. And so it's, it's not good to have them find where you're at. And so to do this research, I used uh, camera traps. Because these chimps, again, they're naive. They're not habituated. So 
if we were on the ground with them, they might see us and look at us, but they're not going to wait for us. And if we move towards them, they're going to move away from us. And so to solve that, we used camera traps. And this was before the hunting camera traps had reached a level where you could actually use those for science and photography. And so I just used normal cameras and Pelican boxes, and we had a cord going to a motion sensor. And so whenever someone would walk through here, then it would start taking photos. And so initially, we didn't get many chimps. And this is actually the only chimp I got for these fruits. And these are fairly sized like pineapple fruits that ferment, so then the animals really like them because they can get a little drunk off them, <laughs> especially the elephants. Um, and so, and then again, you've got all kinds of animals. And so elephants were the big thing we had to worry about with breaking the camera traps. Because if they smelt humans and didn't like it, they would just destroy it. And I didn't use any flash, because if you flash an elephant at night, it's going to destroy whatever, wherever that flash came from, it's running at. Because it's, you know, their eyes are adjusted, and then they get really pissed off. <laughs> <laughs> and so another thing, again, I, like, I love camera traps, because you can get behaviors. So we found out that a lot of the times, the elephants will basically stomp on the food, or like a pre-digestion, they're squishing it before they start eating it, which we didn't realize they were doing. And then it's funny, with a lot of the smaller fruits, they'd pick through them. So they'd pick it up and realize it's not good, and then chuck it. And just you see them just flowing fruit all over the place, which actually is probably pretty good for the tree, because then their seeds are getting a lot farther than they would have normally. But so for the camera traps, most of the animals didn't mind. The chimps, again, they're very smart. And so immediately they hear the clicking. The elephants would hear the clicking too. But they'd hear the clicking, and this is originally what I got a lot of. And so the chimp hears the clicking and then backs off and gets out of there. And so it wasn't till about maybe six months of having the camera traps up that the chimps actually started to get used to them. And then it was the, the dominant males and then the older females that were, we got a lot of because they were the ones that were the, you could say the bravest or the most confident. Um, and so this is that, using that um, to make a brush. So he's just pulling this herb through his teeth and then he's going to have a brush with more surface area. And so this is kind of, you can see. Um, because you have more surface area, there's more places for the termites to bite, basically. And if it's a round stick, it's actually larger, so it is harder for them to bite onto. And so this is them, the toolkit. And so this is a male coming in. And this was important for us to get, because this shows that the chimps thought beforehand. It's not like they found this, they're walking, they see a termite nest, they think, oh, I'm going to eat today. It's they thought beforehand, I'm going to go termite fishing. I've got the tools. And then they show up where they need termite fish. And so first, he, they use the, the harder one to pierce in. And it's always the same sapling. It's the strongest sapling they can find. Um, and it's always the same herb that grows around these termite mounds. And so once they have a hole, then they fish with the stick and then get the termites. And so there's periods where there's less fruit in the forest, like the dry periods. And that's when they use these fallback foods, like termites, very extensively. And so then this is another, an older female, Maya. And so she was the only one we could get close to on the ground, because she really just didn't care. But so her child, Malia, was always staying still far away, like that. Fearlessness didn't get imprinted on her daughter. And this is that, a favorite fruit that um, the gorillas love, um, chimps love, elephants. People actually eat it too. It's a very sticky um, fruit. But this is the type of fruit, so when that gorilla group with Kingo, it's a favorite food. And so they'd find this and get really excited. But then 
I feel like every single time that happened, an elephant would end up coming in, chase off the silverback because he was too big to go up in the trees. And so then all the rest of the troop, the females and the kids would get to stuff themselves with fruit. And he would be over in the corner just steaming. Like you could tell he was not happy. And then the whole rest of the day, he would just be grumpy and not like just <laughs> really pissed off. And so that's, you have all these interactions when you have the different species together. And it, you start to understand like with the elephants and the pigs on the ground, there's, the fruit gets vacuumed up immediately. And so for the primates, they really need to be hitting those trees to get the fruit first. And so this is one of the termite mounds. And these are, they had blue dikers, which is a favorite, another favorite fruit of chimps. But it's a little deer that's just tiny. Um, and so that's why the chimps can catch them, because they're pretty small little antelopes. And so, and then you have a lot of guinea fowl. And these are the red river hogs, which in Cameroon, there you have red river hogs and then the, the savannah warthogs in the same areas. So these are really pretty hogs. And so this elephant heard the clicking, and that's why it's shaking this vine at the camera. But then this is the problem of why the African elephants, have, the forest elephants have started to get hammered. Because they have not just a lot of ivory, but it's actually a much prettier ivory because of the way the tannins get into it. And so it's, that's one of the biggest problems right now is that the ivory trade is really hammering the African elephants to the point that yeah, I mean, it's got to stop soon. Um, and so through all this work that I did with Dave and Cricket, so they are doing research. I was doing the photography, and they are doing the conservation. And so Dave's research was focusing on the logging. And he found out which logging trees were the most important for the chimps and the gorillas. And so he convinced the local, local logging, log, logging company recently to actually stop cutting those trees. And so they're still clearing parts of the forest, but Dave's found that it's not ideal, but as long as you keep certain trees, you actually can keep the chimpanzee populations. And the gorilla populations actually do, usually go up just because there's a flush of vegetation, and that's what the gorillas prefer. And so with these photos, we actually got the, this area next into the national park. And so it was an area that was outside the park, and it was in 2013, they finally got them to add it to the park. So now this area is protected from logging forever, which is great. And so getting back to this idea, so I was working with the scientists, and we, I helped them produce photos for their publication. So all those tool use photos went into the publication. And then all my photos went into the conservation action plans. And then once they had a good plan to present to the government, then they had photos, science, and long-term research to really back up everything. Um, and so with all those things together, it really worked to make a big difference. And so quickly getting into what I'm researching now. And so I originally thought, OK, I'm going to go back to school. I'm going to study tool use with chimps. I want to figure out how tool use evolved with chimpanzees and then with humans, and how honey behaviors evolved. And then I got into the more conservation side and realized if I wanted to do more, that wasn't exactly the track I should go. And I started learning more about agroforestry, which is when you're growing crops under the forest. And so you have cacao and coffee, two of the biggest commodity crops. And they actually grow, they are understory plants. And so you can cut down the forest and grow them, but then you have to put in tons of fertilizer. They die after 20 years because it's not how they should live. But they are slightly more productive. But you can have what they call rustic, and you just clear a little bit of the understory and you plant them in an existing forest. So you're not actually changing 
the dynamics of the force that much. And so, and so whereas, but then the issue is, okay, if you have crops and primate zones, you're going to have crop rating. And so this is a chimpanzee stealing a papaya out of a village <laughs> um, with everyone watching. But it's, so my goal is to figure out, okay, well, what kind of crops can you grow in primate ranges? And is it feasible? Like, are you then going to attract more hunters? Like, because I can study if hunting goes up or not. Um, but the main thing is you can get a village around a national park, and then you can create a buffer zone with this type of plantation, and then the people can actually still have a job, so you can have development. And so there's not this anger at the park for taking away opportunities. And then, ideally, it actually is better for the primates. A lot of studies have shown that. And so I came upon this idea because of working on Bioko. And so Bioko, up to the 1970s when they got oil, had cacao plantations on half the island. So basically everywhere except for the, or even into the national parks a little bit, was cacao plantation. But they only planted in the other store, understory. They didn't actually cut down any trees. And Today, Bioko has the highest density and diversity of primates. So this heavy development didn't have any impact on the primates that were living there. The caveat is there, because of the dictator, no one was allowed to have guns. So people couldn't hunt. So that was the, that's the big factor in this. But the habitat itself was productive for them. And they've shown in South America that monkeys living in these plantations actually have a better fitness just because they have more food. And so this idea of using agroforestry, because then you can actually create corridors. And that's an issue we're running into now, is we have these parks, and then you might have a city in between, or a road, or something that's impassable. And especially for primates, a lot of them have to have a canopy. And so chimps will cross a road, but many of the monkeys, like colobus monkeys, don't want to come down from the canopy. And so if you have an area with just no connecting canopy, you're never going to have gene flow between these two areas. And so I see it as a way that you can actually start connecting parks, but still allow development in areas. Because it's, Africa is about to have a population boom, like the rest of the world is having less population, less babies. But by 2050, Africa is going to double their population. And so then that's more land required for agriculture, in addition to the fact that it's the last largely intact forest in, on the equator. And so now, after Indonesia just got pillaged for palm plantations, and Brazil's kind of coming back into that again, Africa is the next spot that industry is all moving especially Cameroon, because it has a large population, a history of agriculture, and all these governments are very open to people coming and building these huge plantations. And so that's why I kind of ended up focusing on this, because if you can solve that problem of having still developing, still providing jobs, but actually maintaining the forest and the canopy, then you've you've saved the primates. Like, you've saved all the biodiversity in these forests because the canopy is like, that's the number one factor. And then, incidentally, the one thing that can mitigate ch climate change the most is a tree canopy. Mm -hmm. And so, by maintaining canopies in these areas, you're actually protecting the land even more from climate change. And so I'm going to end with three, this, my favorite camera spot, trap spot, but also kind of explaining. So with the research I'm going to do, I'm going to use camera traps. And so you just set it up at a plantation, and I can set it up facing the cacao tree or whatever thing I want to look at, and then see how the animals actually interact. Like, are the primates going to be eating? We can assume they'll eat the bananas, but are they going to eat the cacao? Will they eat the coffee? Um, how they move through that environment, the plantation environment? And so this camera trap is, this is an underground mound. And this is actually a honey badger, which we never saw in person. Um, the, 
no, the trackers really saw it. They had a lot of stories about what they would do, but they they said they were running some packs of dogs and you never see them. But without something like a camera trap, you can't actually study that. And so that's why I feel like it's so useful for agroforestry because you've got the most elusive animals are the animals in the human environment because they're hiding from the humans. And so it's pretty key to have something like that where you can just monitor the area. And so then this is an older female and she's, this is the other style of breaking into the ground where they put their full weight on the stick to break into the ground. But again, you have the child here mimicking and playing, but then learning how to actually do these techniques in the long run. And then, at the same time, so you have the leopard. And the reason the leopard is hanging out here is because this is the most vulnerable stage for the chimp, because they're distracted, they're looking for food. And so, this, the first time this leopard came, he ripped down the, cam the camera trap and it had these claw marks going all the way on the side of it. But then, and we were really excited, but then we were like, oh, we missed this great thing. But then a couple of weeks later, the leopard came back and just fell asleep here and just was lying around. And um, it was great, because the last thing I would ever expect to get was a leopard photo. Um, and I was so happy when I got this. And, and that's it. And I want to, of course, thank David Crick and everyone that helped me here. But thank you all for coming. Yeah. Yeah, so it was Yeah, it was a 70 to 200. So yeah, for me to you probably. But it's, that swamp is really muddy, it's full of biting insects, and so I was actually on the edge of the swamp with my feet in the water. And when I left that site on the airplane, I had like a, this is like a poison ivy thing growing on the side of my leg that was like <laughs> pouring out pus. And, and then when I went to the doctor, I had at least three different types of parasites that I probably got, you know, from getting these photos. <laughs> um, but it is, that water was full of all kinds of bad things. Yeah. Oh, but he loves it, yeah, because it's during the hot part of the day, he can go sit in it. Um, and all those herbs are very nutrient dense. And then he had a whole pattern of washing them before he ate them. Yeah, because the water is very dirty, so he's going <laughs> to... It can be scary in places like Congo and Bioko too, where you have military around a lot. Because right. there's, you know, I'm not used to seeing guys standing around in fatigues holding machine guns and things like that, and looking like intense. You know, you don't want to mess with them. But in general, like the only times I was really in danger was with was for stupid mistakes. So the first time I went to Gulwogo, I was with my father, and because he'd been there before, he said, you know, I know the trail, we'll just go ahead of everyone. And so of course we went the first wrong turn, and we just had a single tent and two cliff bars, no water, oh, enough water for a day, but we were lost for two days. We got lost on Thanksgiving, and we had a watch compass, which back then, those were horrible. So we were being told, oh, you got to go east. Because we had a little satellite pager. So we'd get texts from people. And they told us to go east. And we we're going east, but the, those early compasses on watches were just horrible. So we weren't really going east. Who knows where we were going? And eventually, uh, Marcel saved us because he was taking, cutting really wide cuts in giant circles and then putting arrows which way to go. And so eventually we hit one of those on the second day and were able to walk out. But if that didn't happen, we would, yeah. Uh, 
Uh, yeah, so it's mostly in like National Geographic magazine or um, <laughs> online. Nowadays, Geographic's really the only magazine. There's not as, it's just wildlife photography costs a lot of money and it takes a lot of time. And so even with Geographic now, we're all raising at least half our funds, or if not all the funds ourselves. And so that was another reason why I wanted to come back to school is because if I need to raise grant money, I need to know how to do it. Um, and that's if you're a scientist, that's your job is you're raising grant money. I'm in limbo because I'm in school, but I actually ended up getting, I'm going to get a, I applied for Fulbright for Cameroon, and so far that's, um, it's gone through so far, and since no one actually ever applies to Cameroon, I'm probably <laughs> the only one that applied this year, so um, it should be, that should work out well. And so then I'll have nine months where I actually can spend in Cameroon and do the research. But my, my goal is for my research to be, and good research should be a narrative. And so the research I sh do will be enough to actually have a magazine story. Though it would probably be more of a, a video thing nowadays. Um, just because I'm going to be using a lot of camera traps. And it's, you can connect with people <coughs> faster with video.